the studios in Joplin, Missouri, Good News Productions International presents Venture in Faith, outstanding Christians of our generation telling their own story of how God has worked in their lives. Your host, Boyce Moten. Scriptures teach, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Some of you may think that really cannot be taken literally, but our special guest today takes that verse, and I guess all the Bible, to be really literal. That was Joe Sadler. I wrote a book some years ago called Murder in the Afternoon. And I'm going to ask you to begin, Ella Joe, by telling us about that book and what uh, caused you to write it. That book is a true story that happened in my family when I was 16 years old and two young men walked in with a gun and had every intention of killing the whole family. I did survive and my mother survived. My father and a good friend were killed. And a dozen years later, when I was trying to deal with the bitterness and with the forgiveness that I needed to come to, the Lord led me to write the story, and since then, the book has been used to reach thousands of people, and I think that it's a message I couldn't carry myself to that many people. All right now, I've asked Ella Jo's permission to do this. I hate for her to go all through all of this, but uh, she said it's become a platform to praise God, and so I want for the benefit of our viewers to go back and go through some of the painful details of the story. You lived in Missouri with your parents. Yes, it was an isolated farming community about 100 miles south of St. Louis. Very quiet, peace-loving people in that community. And this was in the afternoon of sunny summer Saturday. And it was the most unusual of things to happen. But it did happen in our family. So uh, your father ran a grocery store and gas station out in the country. Yes, he did. And these two young men, uh, ages 14 and 19, I think, at the time, decided they wanted to steal a car? Yes, they wanted to steal our car and go into town that evening. So they were going to kill us all in order to take the car. So they came up to, now your father's store was about 100 yards from the house. So they came up, what happened in the store? Well, as they told the story later, they came in and asked my dad to fix them a sandwich. He had a little delicatessen. And so he started to cut the meat, and they edged around behind him and shot him in the back. Then they took his car keys and all of his keys from his pocket, but they became disoriented, I suppose, when they couldn't find the right key, threw the keys away, and then came to the house and shot my mother twice and beat my friend and me with the gun uh, um, I have never asked you this question before. Did the court testimony indicate that either of them were on drugs or alcohol? No, it really didn't. They said that they had bought six beers and they had drunk those early in the afternoon and then walked about a dozen miles and yet they supposedly had courage from this alcohol. They thought they had courage, which couldn't have been much. So they, uh, they had sh shot your father in the back, killed him. They only had three shells. So now then, they come towards the house, and uh, s you did something that saved your mother's life. Tell us about that. Yes, at that period of time, ladies often had this type of a wave clamp. They were called a little male metal clamp and I put these across the back of her hair because she wore rows of waves. On that particular day we were a little short of time as I remember in the afternoon. My girlfriend and I had dates for the evening and and it was the afternoon was passing and m my mother said no I'll just put some little pin curls in that'll be all right. And I said no I'm going to do a thorough job and and so I ran upstairs. We lived in a two-story farmhouse and 
I ran upstairs and rummaged until I found the wave clamp and put several rows of them across the back of her head. So then the shot which grazed her head shattered the wave clip, clips and the hair clips, forcing pieces under her scalp along with the gunshot, which she still has under her scalp to this she's day. She's still living. Yes. She's very and, uh, vibrant as I, very lively. Th these murders come and your mama starts to run and they shoot her twice. Yes. Once in the shoulder and it shot off a finger. Yes. And then the second time in the back of the head, but because she had these, even though she was seriously or critically injured, I know that she ran just a short distance and then collapsed. Yes, she did. She collapsed at the gate. She thought that she would get all the way to the road, apparently, or else maybe get to the car. And she collapsed just when a passerby was driving and saw her on the road. So the passerby saw that she had been shot, didn't know really, probably unarmed, and didn't know what was waiting in the house, so they just put your mom in the car, took her to the hospital. Yes, and uh, before she collapsed, she said uh, that there were two more of us in the kitchen, that's all, that she knew at that time, so they took her to the hospital and sent ambulances back to pick the other two of us up. So that left you and your girlfriend alone with the murderers? No, they had gone by this time. We don't know whether they became frightened by a noise. We don't know just what happened, but they had left in the meantime. They right, had but gone now, away. They only had three shells. They shot your daddy once and they shot your mama twice, so they didn't have any shells. What did they... So they might have become frightened and they left the broken gun on the floor and fled. But the way the gun got broken was they were beating you and your girlfriend. Yes, and they shattered the gun stock. They took the gun and they literally beat your girlfriend to death. That's right. And they beat you so severely you were unconscious for three weeks and they thought you were dead. That's right. And I understand that any one of the many wounds to your head could conceivably have killed you, but somehow God protected yes, you. Yes, I think it was the gunman's stance, it was the exact point of impact of the gun stock. It was where he was standing in relationship to my position that made the point of impact to be just within a half inch either direction, the doctor told me later. Would have killed you. Yes, it would either have killed me or it would have meant my eyesight would have been taken away or all my uh, physical functions. So you were at least three weeks unconscious. When you came to, you began to sort and sift through all of this terrible experience. And for many years, you were a captive to this bondage, bondage and fear. Is that overstating the case? No, that isn't. I figure that I was literally running from that memory, from that horror for all those years. A dozen years went by when I was just so frightened. And after that, I began to realize how the Lord was using this story, and I began to praise the Lord. It wasn't over, really, but I, I had begun to uh, come to the Lord with it, and now I know that He can save me from that, too. But another spinoff, tragic result of this, was the fact that you developed multiple sclerosis. And the doctors say that perhaps the stress and the injuries may have had some part in bringing that to the surface in your life. Yes, they do think that the cause is uh, stress-related. I have inherited a weakness in the deficient, a deficiency in my defense mechanism. That is, the antibodies my, that I would create to fight flu or cold or any disease, even a, a, a minor one, then my body would react to that and would create another chemical that caused a weakening in muscles and, and uh, so that I have, have had some damage in the muscles. And what I now have, I'm in remission, but I have residual damage 
I have fatigue and uh, lack of balance and some of these things that were, were caused by the first attack. So you were victimized in a very real sense of the word. You, your daddy was dead. He couldn't come to your graduation. He couldn't be a part of your wedding ceremony. He couldn't be there when the grandkids were born. Uh, he was gone. He couldn't offer you the love, the support, the help. Uh, your mother traumatized, but I, I must say again, you came from a Christian family, which, oh, what a difference that must have made. Yes, I did. I, I knew a lot of scripture, and I knew what it meant to see Christians in the church that I grew up in, not only just my family and close friends, but other people who were what I call the kneeling Christians. There used to be a song that was popular when I was a child growing up, get your knees acquainted with the rocky ground. And I knew right then these were the kneeling Christians because that was the pose I saw in them. And uh, for many years you'd been reading the Bible, studying the Bible, but 12 years or so into this traumatic nightmare, some scriptures that you had never really focused on before all of a sudden began to rise to the surface of your attention and thinking. Scriptures about praise. Tell us how that happened. Well, uh, first of all came uh, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are fitting into his plan. And I had heard that just before this crime, and I knew that the Lord was saying to me that he was using every experience, and he was there with me even while I was in a very painful and difficult place. So then when it became obvious that I was to write this story a dozen years later. I remembered Isaiah 6, 8, when God said, Whom shall I send and who will go? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And I just took that verse to mean we're going. If Isaiah was going, it was however the Lord was sending him. And uh, the Lord said almost the same thing to Jeremiah. He said, I want you to go to whoever I send you to and say whatever I tell you to say. And so I thought he was saying the same thing to me. Well, you know that the Christian armor doesn't have any protection for our back. The only way we can really be victorious is by facing the foe. So for 12 years you were running. Now then you turned around and you said, the Lord's not going to leave me. The Lord's not going to forsake me. He that's within me is greater than he that's in the world. So you face the biggest obstacle you'd ever had in your life, and uh, you conquered, didn't you, with the help of Christ? Yes, I did. I learned to praise the Lord anyway, even when it is not pleasant, it is not something I would have asked for. I could see that the Lord used this in his scheme of things in ways I could never even imagine, and that brought more victories, as I told you earlier, because I had such a terrible fear that I had to overcome. This all came about when I learned to praise the Lord. Then I was able to forgive my enemies, to see myself as standing in the same positions alongside them if Jesus were looking at us from the cross and we were standing in an open field side by side that he was forgiving us. He needed to forgive me in the same way he needed to forgive them. And then came the victory over fear. Yeah, the Bible says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So some of our viewers may have been guilty of hate. You've never certainly taken anybody's life physically, but you still saw yourself as a sinner desperately in need of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. So you were able to pass on that grace even to the men who murdered your daddy. Now, I want to point out uh, we're not legal people, we're not judges and juries and so forth. Just because you can forgive a murder doesn't mean he should be out on the street. No, definitely not. I can forgive from the heart. I can be willing that the Lord would reach out to him and that he would become aware of his sins and ask forgiveness so that he could be forgiven. But I don't want to see him walking around the streets. I don't think he needs to be able to be in a position to do this to someone else. Now, this is the, the, the problem with, you know, 
the judges in the court systems make those judgments. But one of the reasons why people like that are placed behind bars is so that they cannot commit other senseless, irrational crimes. So many people are unpredictable, you know, that you just don't know what you, well, I don't think they would, ever, but you don't know what they might ever do again. And with some reluctance, I got to say that I, you've got such a positive attitude, I hope this doesn't dampen it, but I understand just last week in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, the, the oldest murderer uh, is trying to get a lawyer to sue you for violating his civil rights. Yes, he is. He's, uh, he's saying that even though I used a fictitious name, people know that it was the crime that he committed. But I figure that the Lord has that under control too. If, if for some reason he wants this to be allowed to happen, it would be just yet another platform for his glory because the printed word cannot be stopped and God's word is in it. It's gone to criminology students it's gone to thousands of people all over the world, and so I figure that if the Lord wants to use this platform, he can do it. I understand that the book, is, incidentally, the book is, I think, now out of print, but it went through five printings, thousands of copies, and one uh, criminology professor used your book with his students? Yes, and it also won the Award for Excellence in Christian Literature. Well, that's quite an honor. Now, the one thing that we're going to try and focus on in the time that we have left is you, our viewers, who may not yet be where Ella Jo is. You may not be able to praise God for the circumstances in which you find yourself. You may be consumed by bitterness. And all of those kind of things uh, have a tendency to put your light under a bushel. We want it on a candlestick so that it will illuminate uh, the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's go back and talk about some of these scriptures. Uh, as, as you were coming through this morass of difficulty, all of a sudden, the scriptures started coming to your mind, and you began to see victory in Jesus Christ. Give me some of the scriptures. Okay, in Hebrew thirteen fifteen, it says, let's continually offer the sacrifice of praise. If it's called a sacrifice, I take that to mean for things that we might not be praising God for. And it's, it also means we're not taking credit for something that, uh, that you or I might think we had done. It's offering, as it says, a sacrifice, and continually, that's like praising the Lord anyway. It's something I didn't ask for, something I didn't want, but I know how the Lord is able to use it for His glory. And Psalms... Well, let me, let me go back now. We'll take these kind of one at a time because some of our viewers are going to want to savor these experiences. Now, if I understand the Hebrew letter, it was written to Hebrew Christians in Palestine many of whom had been suffering because of their faith. They had come to Christ perhaps 30 years before on the day of Pentecost following our Lord's resurrection. They had been so generous, they had sold their possessions and goods and parted the uh, proceeds to all men as every man had need. They brought them to the apostles and distribution was made unto everybody. But now many years had gone by. There had been great famine in the land, so they maybe didn't have a good job. They didn't have a place to live. They had to depend upon Gentiles throughout the Mediterranean world to send money. Uh, some of them had suffered joyfully the spoiling of their goods, but now they were questioning their faith. And uh, I think the book of Hebrews was written to say, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If somebody draws back, God has no pleasure in that kind of a person. We've got to remain faithful until death. So it's in that context Hebrews 13, 15, that the inspired writer of this glorious book says we need to offer the sacrifice of praise. So maybe some of our viewers are having financial difficulty and you've had something taken away from you. But you can still make a sacrifice of praise. Okay, next And scripture. earlier in that same chapter, we have the marvelous words that Jesus has said, I will never, never forsake you. That's yes. why you can continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Over in the second chapter, it says that he's the author of eternal salvation, and he was made perfect through suffering, so we can identify with him. Yeah, though we were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. 
or and in Hebrews 13. That's one of my favorite scriptures. And uh, frequently in the hospital when somebody is very, very ill, and I know they don't have the mental energies to focus on a long passage, I will frequently quote Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. And there are five negatives in the Greek language all lined up. The Greek language was bankrupted to convince every reader that Jesus Christ will not abandon you. Okay, next scripture. Then in Psalms 50, verse 14, 15, and 23, offer a sacrifice of thanks because God says this really honors me. And he said, I want you to trust me when you're in trouble so that I can rescue you and then you can glorify God. That meant so much to me because I thought it has to mean giving thanks for everything. Else it wouldn't be a sacrifice. Is that a Psalm of David? I'm sorry, I don't know. There are, there are different writers of the Psalms, but David, if it is a Psalm of David, and I'm assuming that it is, he really had some trials, didn't he? Definitely. You just stop and look at the time King Saul was after him, he hadn't done anything wrong. His son Absalom took over the kingdom. Kingdom was split, warfare everywhere. Uh, one time he said to Jonathan, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. And throughout his life, he knew what it was to suffer and face dangers and hardships. But he remained a man after God's own heart, and he learned that in the midst of trouble, he could still praise. The Psalms are filled with praise, aren't they? And you could give thanks for the prospect is joy for the righteous from Proverbs 24 and from uh, Psalms 116, the light dawns even in darkness for the upright, the righteous person who is devoted to God. And the, the person doesn't even fear bad news. That's 119.7. Your mother has remained real positive through all this. Tell me about your mama. She has always been positive, And her faith is just an example to hundreds of people. She has has said before that it's an honor to be used by the Lord to suffer as an example to other people. And she, as at the time we're doing this interview, 82 years young. She's almost 82. And she's still in good health. Yes. In spite of the multiple fragments embedded in her skull and so forth, and the loss of a finger, she's remained positive. And uh, oh my, what a, uh, what a blessing, a testimony like this to people the man one time said, I complained because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And I got to say that God, I don't think, likes griping and complaining. He likes praise. The Psalm 22, 3 says, Jehovah inhabits the praises of his saints. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure, and I can tell you've really studied the Bible. I'm sure you've studied the book of Job. Is there some verse in the book of Job that means a lot to you? Yes, there is a Chapter 23, verse 10, God says to Job, After I've tried you, you'll come forth as gold. As gold. And that just equates to the verse in First Peter, Your faith, which is more precious than gold, which is refined by the fire, will be proved. Yeah, I'm almost tempted to try and say a poem here. I don't know that I can remember it, but he sat by the fire of sevenfold heat, and he watched by his precious sore, and the closer he bent with a searching gaze as he heated it more and more. He knew he had ore that could stand the test, and he wanted the finest gold to mold as a crown for the king to wear, set with gems at a price untold. So he laid our gold in the burning fire, Though we fain would have said him nay. And he watched the dross that we hadn't seen as it melted and vanished away. And our gold grew brighter and yet more bright, but our eyes were so dim with tears. We saw but the flames, not the master's hand, and questioned with anxiety's fears. Do you think that it pleases his loving heart to cause us one moment's pain? Ah, no, but he saw through the present cross the bliss of eternal gain. So he waited there with a watchful eye, with a love that was strong and sure, 
and his gold did not suffer a bit more heat than was needed to make it pure. I memorized that poem uh, to recite at my brother's funeral. My brother died of cancer just two or three years ago, and he had suffered a great deal. And uh, at that point in time, I remembered Simon Peter who wrote those words about our gold being more pure than, uh, our faith being more pure than of gold which perisheth though it be tried by fire. Peter at one time didn't want Jesus to suffer. He didn't see any association with suffering and anything good. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, I've got to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the chief priest, scribes, and elders. Peter said, oh, Lord, no. Don't do that. It's so incongruous with your kingdom. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art a stumbling block. So you've learned the same lesson that Peter had, and you've learned it firsthand. The suffering you've gone through has not really diminished your faith, has it? No, it really hasn't. It's made it stronger. And uh, with reference to Job, nothing could happen to Job but what God okayed it. The devil came and said, well, no wonder Job is this way. I'll do this to him. And he could only do to him what the Lord permitted him to do. And so in your life, it's been the same way. And and so I think that uh, when we're yielded to God, when we're praising him for what he knows is going to be the outcome of the situation, if it's, even if it's terrible and, and uncomfortable. That sends the devil a message. Yes. You uh, have not only written the book, but you have lectured all over the country, I guess, telling this story about a platform. What is the lecture you call, uh, what do you speak on? I'm speaking more often on Free to Praise, which is the title of my new book. Oh, you have a new book come out, and it'll be called Free to Praise. To Praise. And you feel like that you are no longer in bondage. No. You've been delivered, and you are free to praise. But you're not quite done with the book yet, I understand, or? It will be out the end of the year. The end of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this praise, Uh, You have found a freedom and an opportunity to glorify God and also power to live victoriously in the Christian life. Now, uh, I want to know if if there are moments, you say 12 years into this you began to gain a victory. Do you have relapses sometime? And the reason I ask this is not to be negative, but it's to try and relate your experiences to our viewers so that they know this is a real story. Yes, the mind is a projector that, well, the devil would like you to see those old pictures. We know that. And I talked to someone just this week who said she has relapses. She has backflashes of some very bitter experiences. And I said, well, I know what you're talking about. I've had it too. But if you can exchange the frame in that projector and you can focus on what the Lord has done, his power, and John 16:33, when Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but cheer up, I've overcome the world. And in 1 John 4, 18, it says, perfect love casts out fear. So you can exchange the picture for the victory that he can bring. And then every time one of those bad pictures come, you can just exchange it. And that's the beginning of trust in God, knowing what he has done, what he can do. As you speak to women's groups around the country, what one scripture has meant more to them than any other? Or do you have a way of knowing? Well, I think it's those ones I mentioned first on praise because it's such a new phenomenon. People don't realize the power that's available to them until they start to really use it and start to thank God because he knows the end from the beginning, as Isaiah wrote, 46.10. And, you know, Catherine Marshall said something kind of like that. She said, if you're in a storm, Christian, or if I'm in a storm, I know that the Lord is in there with me because I wouldn't be in it unless he were in it too. So I might as well start to thank him for how he will get me out of it how he will help me through it, and how he will get me out of it. You mentioned about praise being something new, and I concur in that, in a sense. 
But in another sense, it's a very old doctrine, isn't it? It's as old as the Psalms. It's it really as, is. It's as old as the Bible, but uh, there was a time when the Christian world all of a sudden woke up to the Sunday school and started a Sunday school movement. There was a time when the Christian world woke up to world evangelism and started a missionary movement. And now then, it seems like the Christian world is starting to focus in on the many, many scriptures in the Holy Bible that deal with the subject of praise. What's, what's your favorite song? Do you have a praise chorus that means a lot to you? Yes, I like... Uh Praise the Lord, he can work through, the, through those who praise him. Praise the Lord, for the Lord inhibits praise. The chains that seem to bind me fall powerless behind me, serve only to remind me that they fall, fall powerless behind me when I praise him. Uh, you were telling me a little while ago the story of Joseph, Jehoshaphat. Tell that to our viewers. Well, that has been really meaningful to me because in Second Chronicles 20, when Jehoshaphat said, uh, Lord, I don't know what to do. I, I see we're facing this army. They're bigger than we are. We're, we're short-handed. We're ill-prepared. What, what are we going to do? I'll just bring this to you because I don't know what to do. And the Lord said, uh, the battle's in my hands. Don't be afraid. So what God outlined a plan for Jehoshaphat to do was to station his army in such a manner that praise would be in front of the army. And they went out to face the enemy. And uh, what happened when they got there? The enemy forces just turned on each other and massacred each other. So Jehoshaphat's army just turned around and praised God from the front and from the rear, marched all the way back to the temple praising God. And the significance of that is they went into the battle with praise and won the battle. And in your own life, you have applied this principle so that when you're facing a difficulty, you begin with praise? Is That's it? right. Um, even in this situation of a lawsuit that I mentioned a moment ago, if, if God forbid, uh, this man should find an attorney who would feel like you had done something wrong and violated his civil rights, even then, you'd feel like God would still be able to make something good out of it. So you'd start praising Him. God will have the last word. Whatever happens, it will only be if He allows it. All things still work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. Ella Jo, it's been a delightful experience for me to just share the uh, radiance of your faith. You really have been a, a help and a testimony to me. And I, uh, aren't you better than you were four years ago? I got to meet you four years ago, and it seemed like to me that you haven't aged a bit and that your health is, uh, you're in remission now. You weren't, I don't think, with this mul multiple sclerosis when I saw you last. Yes, I really am thankful for that. You know, Edith Schaefer said in her book, Affliction, she said, it's a greater miracle if the Lord so chooses that you learn to live with the disability or the illness, cope with it, rise above it, and give the Lord the thanks that he deserves. This is really a greater miracle than if he were to heal you instantaneously. It's a greater miracle to let him help you live with it. You know, Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I had a thorn in the flesh, I asked the Lord three times to take it away. The Lord said, no. My grace is sufficient. So he said, I found out that the Lord's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Mm -hmm. Or in 2 Timothy 4, he said, Trophimus have I left at my leadum sick. Well, I don't know all the reasons why, but I know, as you've said, God is going to be praised. And it doesn't matter what uh, the enemies of Christ do. Uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the chief priests and the Pharisees, uh, on Friday, uh, they may have been laughing, but Sunday was coming. And that's when we as Christians rejoice because we serve a risen Savior and we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 9, Paul said, this happened that we might rely not on ourselves but on God. This was after he had been beaten and shipwrecked and all sorts of things and he said, 
God has delivered us and he will continue to deliver, to deliver us. This is why it happened that we could rely on God. Now, uh, I'm going to kind of turn you loose here. Uh, we're down to just a very few minutes left. And uh, I'm still thinking of the housewife, the businessman, the student who is depressed and discouraged and not re really sure which way to turn, where to go. But they got a problem with bitterness and uh, they got a problem with fear. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, Ella Jo, to look them right in the eye. Take as long as you want to and share your faith with them that they might rejoice in the Lord always as you do. Well, First John 4, 4, he says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's the only way that you would ever be able to praise the Lord. But once you do start, there's a power in praise, and he can work out the details according to his glory, and then you'll be glad, and you will gain more than you ever could have any other way. Because if you were just bitter about what happened, well, what good would that do? That would just eat you up physically. And if you turn it over to the Lord, he can bring good out of it, and then you'll be praising him for that too. And so that's good. 